and it is a great pleasure to welcome you to the Samuel and Althea Strom Lectures in Jewish Studies presented by the Jewish Studies Program and the Henry M. Jackson School of International Studies. This week-long series, now in its 18th year, has become a major intellectual event in the city of Seattle. For three evenings every year, both the university and the larger community have the unusual opportunity to examine in depth issues of current concern in Jewish cultural life under the watchful guidance of some of the most talented and creative figures in the world of modern Jewish scholarship. The lectureship and the publication series in which it results, published by the University of Washington Press, is made possible by a permanent gift from the Samuel and Althea Strom Philanthropic Fund of the Endowment Fund of the Jewish Federation of Greater Seattle. And so I would like to take this moment once again to thank Sam and Althea Strom for this most significant contribution to the production and dissemination of ideas. <clears throat> Over the last few years, the Strom lecturers have led us through a varied intellectual terrain, from notions of death and dying in Jewish spirituality, to the quest for, for the mystical union of all knowledge, to the role of gender in the modern Jewish experience. This year's speaker, Samuel C. Heilman, will be addressing a subject that is perhaps part of the personal experience of many of us here tonight the lives, cultural patterns, identities, and future prospects of American Jewry since the end of the Second World War. Samuel Heilman, who is professor of sociology at the City University of New York, Queens College, is a social anthropologist and ethnographer in the tradition of Irving Goffman, Claude Lévi-Strauss, and Clifford Geertz. He portrays, describes, and explains the dynamics of living cultures by entering them, as it were, as a participant observer. From this vantage point, he has studied numerous phenomena, including the modern American synagogue, which was published as Synagogue Life, a study in symbolic interaction. Study circles in Jerusalem, the people of the book, Drama, Fellowship, and Religion, 1987. The Modern Orthodox Community in America, which he um, wrote together with Stephen M. Cohen as Cosmopolitans and Parochials. And most recently, I hope you've seen this book, most recently, Ultra-Orthodox Jews in Israel, the Haredim, uh, published as Defenders of the Faith Inside Ultra-Orthodox Jewry in 1992. Professor Heilman's 1985 book, The Gate Behind the Wall, A Pilgrimage to Jerusalem, was awarded the Present Tense Literary Award for the best book in religious thought. And his A Walker in Jerusalem won a National Jewish Book Award. Those of us who have had a chance to read Sam Heilman's latest book, Defenders of the Faith, will, I think, agree that there are three traits that set his work apart from that of other sociologists and anthropologists of modern Jewry. The first is his style. He is a masterful writer whose books give lie to the notion that social science has to be difficult to read. On the contrary, Sam Heilman's social science reads like the best fiction. Second is his ability to evoke, to make real his subject matter. One cannot read his description of a visit to a mikvah, for example, a ritual bath, without feeling the, the very slipperiness of the wooden skids leading from the showers to the underground bath, or without wincing from the first contact with the icy waters of the bath itself. When one accompanies the author on a pilgrim, pilgrimage to the Rebbe's Tish, the rabbi's afternoon table at the, sur, at the third Sabbath meal, one almost feels the crush of the crowd that surges to forward to get a better view of the Hasidic leader. 
I think I caught myself flexing my elbows against the arms of my chair as I endeavored to hold my own against the mass of humanity. The final characteristic is one of distance, self-consciousness, and detachment. For Sam Heilman knows that the observer is never fully part of the group, that the ability to report and describe entails a degree of alienation from that which is being observed. And I think there's a very good illustration of this necessary detachment and alienation which he recounts in Defenders of the Faith one afternoon um, on his way to the ultra-Orthodox uh, centers of Jerusalem. Sam came across uh, a young five-year-old boy and his little sister walking the streets. The, uh, the children were members of, uh, of a, a Hasidic group and dressed in typical Hasidic garb and they looked at at Sam, who obviously was not one of them, the boy said to his sister in Yiddish, Kikna goy, <laughs> which means, look here, there's a goy on the street. And Sam, mustering his best Yiddish, said, Aber ich, nicht, ich bin nicht a goy, ich bin a Yid. I'm not a, I'm not a goy, in fact, I am a Jew. True objectivity, on the other hand, is never achieved. And the ethnographer, Sam reminds us, must always be mindful of the ways in which his or her own prejudices and emotions, his or her very presence, mold the story that is being told. Sam Heilman never tries to hide the observing self from his descriptions of Haredi life. And he is conscious throughout of the distorting effect that his presence has on the very subject that he is trying to capture. The title of Professor Heilman's lectures this year is Choosing to be Jews, a Sociological Reflection on American Jews since 1950. The lectures will continue on Thursday evening, April 22nd, same time and same place, when he will speak on two types of Jews, the choices made in the 60s and 70s. And then again, the following Tuesday, a week from tonight, April 27th, on the topic, Whither American Jewry? Quantity versus quality, issues of the 80s and 90s. Tonight's talk is entitled, Starting Over, Acculturation and Suburbia, the Jews of the 50s. Thank you very much for that really uh, wonderful introduction. I think I'd like to take uh, Hillel with me wherever I go. <clears throat> and I want to say as well how pleased I am to be able to be here. Uh, this wonderful lecture series has really uh, had a, uh, I think, a very important impact on Jewish studies, not only here in Seattle, but uh, throughout the world. In fact, as I'm sure many, if not all of you know, there are two maps of the world. There's the real map of the world, or what some people call the real map of the world, and there's the Jewish map of the world. And in the Jewish map of the world, there are different cities which loom large, and other cities which loom small. And I think it's fair to say that you folks here in Seattle have made Seattle begin to loom very large in the Jewish world. So when the Jewish map is rewritten, Seattle will certainly continue to have a very honored place. Uh, I, I do uh, speak very much as a participant observer on the subject of tonight's uh, and the next two lectures, since I am as well an American Jew. And this period of the post-war, in effect, is the period of my life. So with your permission, I'm going to begin my remarks, not only in the way of introduction to the subject this evening, but really to start almost with my own life, because I see a kind of parallelism between these two developments. In January of 1950, the start of the second half of the 20th century, I was a passenger on the United States Navy transport ship General Stuart Heinzelmann. For four years, my parents, survivors of the concentration camps, had lived in Karlsruhe, Germany, where I was born after the war. We had lived in relative luxury during those four years after my father had been appointed by the American occupation forces as an overseer of a large textile factory. But, as historian Lucy Davidovich has put it, America beckoned with the future. Now on board this floating refugee camp, along with approximately 1,100 other displaced persons, most of them Holocaust survivors. My parents and I, having left behind a large apartment 
maids, and all the comforts that the factory provided, we're on our way to America to begin a new life. Arriving on Friday the 13th, we would join about 100,000 other DPs who had already arrived since that first transport in May of 1946, hoping somehow to reconstruct our lives and ourselves and our people in what seemed at the time the most secure haven for Jews in the diaspora. With the destruction of nearly all of European Jewry, which in 1933 had been 46% of the world's Jews, America now indisputably had become the new center of diaspora Jewry. My father was hopeful, my mother was in trauma, and I had no idea what to expect. To be sure, the two-year-old new state of Israel also beckoned many Jews like us. By 1950, its reality had already begun to shape the mind and the activities of American Jewry. Indeed, on the very day of our arrival, the New York Times headlined a plea, I hadn't read it then, but I've read it since, <laughs> headlined a plea from the former president of the Zionist Organization of America demanding support for the fledgling Jewish state and announced that Henry Morgenthau, Jr., chairman of the UJA, had flown to Tel Aviv to confer with Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion about anticipated financial backing that the American Jews were expected to provide. Two days later, New York Mayor O'Dwyer declared a general mobilization day for the Zionist Organization of America and called on Jews of New York to affiliate themselves with it. Similar drives were held throughout the country. But for many of the war scarred, like my parents, Israel was not attractive. The thought of having to struggle for life in a, new, in a new and poor country, in a land that although promised by God to our people, was still very much contested by a hostile Arab population, was overwhelming for my parents and therefore inconceivable. Instead, they chose to abandon Europe and come here where they believed that behind the cover, the protective cover of American might, and in the secure embrace of its democracy and its economic opportunity, we could once again find life. Had they read the newspaper a week later, they would have read a report confirming their decision to turn toward America rather than Israel. Visiting some of Israel's immigration camps, the American chairman of the UJA proclaimed himself, quote, shocked by the poor conditions of immigrants there. While in America, the headlines noted, DP's quick to catch tempo of America survey shows. At three and a half years old, I was too young to understand any of this at the time. But when I watched my father leave for work on the bus to go to his job as a 75 cent an hour shipper, rather than seeing him driven to the factory by his chauffeur in, as in Germany, I recall asking him why we had given up so much to come to Boston where we now lived. His answer, which he repeated throughout the years as I continued to query his decision to come to America was simply, I didn't want you to be the only Jewish child in the school. He believed America would preserve and protect our family's Jewish future. And for that, he had been ready to start all over again. But what was Jewish life like in America in the 1950s when we arrived? And was my father correct in making his decision to turn toward Boston rather than Jerusalem. What has happened to American Jewry during this last half of the 20th century? Has this been the place that preserved and protected Jewish life? Or did those who chose to go to Israel make the right turn? Was Elliot Cohen, the first editor of Commentary Magazine, correct when he wrote in its first issue in November 1945 that American Jews, as he put it, will evolve new patterns of living new modes of thought which will harmonize heritage and country into a true sense of an at-homeness in the modern world. In the course of these lectures, my purpose will be to explore these general questions by taking a retrospective view of American Jewry since the 1950s. For however tumultuous the first half of this century was for Jewry in general, with its mass migrations, two world wars, pogroms, and holocaust, and the remarkable and miraculous reestablishment of the ancient Jewish homeland in Israel, 
the last four and a half decades have been no less decisive. Inexorably, the events that have allowed Jews to live in relative security have presented them with perhaps an even greater challenge than did the adversity and upheaval of the years leading up to 1950. The new haven in America, with its myriad of new possibilities and the absence of organized anti-Semitism, made the membrane of Jewish life almost completely permeable. The core, as we all know today, began to shrink while the periphery was pulled ever further away. American Jews became no less American than any other group, and some might argue they became more American than any other group. In the reorganization of America in this last half of the century, the Jews have jumped into the thick of things and were caught up in the whirlwind. Some might argue the Dickens' famous opening lines in his A Tale of Two Cities best captures the Jewish experience in America during these last years. I know you all know the lines, but I'm going to repeat them because they are so much the story of my next three lectures. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. This has been a time when American Jews have experienced a minimum of prejudice, when almost all domains of life have been open to them. But it has also been a time of extraordinary assimilation, of swelling rates of intermarriage, and of large numbers of people simply ignoring their Jewishness completely. This is a time when Jewish physical safety is unparalleled in history, except perhaps by those few ultra-Orthodox who still live in our inner city neighborhoods like Crown Heights in Brooklyn. But Jewish cultural integrity seems more precarious than ever before. This is a time when the Jewish population of America is steadily diminishing in numbers, certainly relative to the general American population. In the last 40 years, while America grew by over two-thirds, American Jewry grew, depending on how you count Jews, by a fifth. Moreover, as the 1990 National Jewish Population Survey demonstrates, the number of people who fill everyone's definition of who or what is a Jew has actually shrunk to about 4.4 million. This is a time when Jews have no trouble building synagogues, but they have all sorts of trouble filling them. This has been a time when the quality of Jewish education for those who receive it is perhaps higher than ever before in our history. The output of Jewish scholarship, whether in yeshivas or in university Jewish studies programs, is overwhelming in its scope and amplitude. Would we have seen anything like this in the 1950s? But it is also a time when most American Jews receive the most minimal of such education, a time when a majority of these people, who are the people of the book, do not read the great books of Jewish life. And even if they wanted to, most could neither read nor comprehend the great corpus of Jewish literature in its Hebrew or Aramaic original. To put it simply, the people of the book can't and don't read the book. Along with the many cultural islands populated by Jewish scholars, there is a surrounding sea of those who are Jewish illiterates. This is a time when there's no shame in being a Jew, and yet fewer of our Jews seem to know what being a Jew means. This is a time when American Jews can and do marvel at the accomplishments of a Jewish state in Israel, but when less than half of them have ever visited it, and practically none of them would ever entertain the thought of living there. This is a time when Jewish wealth and power reaches into the corridor of American power and influence. But the number of those who give to Jewish causes shrinks daily.
This is the best of times and the worst of times. How did all of this come to be? What does it portend for the Jewish future? I'm not certain that I can fully answer these questions, but they shall guide what I will be talking about in what follows. So let us begin with looking at what the situation of American Jewry was in the 1950s. But to begin, we need to talk, or at least remind ourselves, of what the 1950s were like for all of America. The 1950s were a time when Americans sought to return to normalcy. When the war was over and people wanted to get back to life as they imagined it should be. It was a time of economic prosperity, a time when land was available, when the GI Bill made it possible for Americans to get an education, when property was something that was within their grasp, that buying a home was a dream that all of them shared, and a home not simply anywhere, but a home in the suburbs. The Levittowns, the period of time when uh, tracts and the suburban frontier, when uh, farm fields were being transformed into housing for the returning soldiers, small houses to be sure, which grew overnight. In fact, in a sense, suburbia, which offered everybody a new start with a new identity, moving out of the city, away from families, moving up and moving out. Suburbia, many have argued, represented the third great culture in American history. In a sense, American history, until the 1950s, went through two epochs. The first was the epochs of the small towns of rural America. The second epoch was the rise of the great cities, primarily, you should excuse me, of the East. And in the end, we come to the third great epoch, the epoch of suburbia, with its cars, its televisions, its nuclear family. I think it's safe to say that in the 1950s, perhaps a greater rite of passage than the bar mitzvah was getting a driver's license. And can I have the keys to the car was probably a question asked more frequently than the four questions at the Seder <coughs> on Passover. It was a time when the notion of bedroom communities was emerging of what was then the father breadwinner leaving in the morning, going to work, not seeing his family until they were safely tucked in bed at night and on the weekends, of extraordinarily uh, lonely nuclear family isolation. Gone was the support community of the cities. And the family was by and large left on its own in those homes, those small homes. Their window to the world, at first a very small window, but soon a larger window through which the world was shaped almost in a kind of mirror image of the world that they were inhabiting. We know that window, that electronic window, was television. That loneliness of suburbia came about in part because suburbia, while it promised a new start and hope for the future, also came with the decline of community. It was not unusual in suburbia to know perhaps the people on the left of you, the people on the right of you, the people across the street, but no one else. The source of community in the suburbia was the PTA. But the PTA could not take the place of community. In a sense, suburbia offered splendid isolation. It placed tremendous pressures on the breadwinners to provide. It placed tremendous pressures on the women who were behind to find meaning in their lives beyond chauffeuring kids to school and to piano lessons and whatever else there was and preparing for the return of the husband from work, that father's, father knows best world 
that many of us grew up watching thinking that was the way life was. Whatever great problems there were could be solved within a half an hour, and father always knew best. And it was the tremendous pressure on the children to always provide what I guess in Jewish terms we would call nachas, but everyone, whether Jew or not, recognized that the, the role of the children was to provide some kind of entertainment and pride for the parents. And of course, the suburbs also gave us that phrase and the world behind it, which we all knew, the keeping up with the Joneses. The idea of conspicuous consumption, of somehow demonstrating that you had made it even if you hadn't quite made it. The 50s were also a period of the Cold War, of a rising anxiety about that, what was once called the nuclear sword of Damocles that hung over all of us. It was the period of McCarthyism. It was the period of the 1953 Rosenberg trial and execution. It was also the period in 1954 of the landmark Brown versus Board of Education case, which demonstrated, perhaps among other things, that not only white Christians of European ancestry were entitled to full civil and social rights in the United States. In effect, what the Board of Education decision in 1954 was saying was that blacks could be white like everyone else, that everybody could be a wasp, that everybody could enter into this great melting pot of assimilation. The pressures for assimilation were great. They offered everyone a chance to be like everyone else, and it, it was this period when Elliot Cohen, perhaps quoting a line that had been heard before, said, the Jews are like everybody else, only more so. <laughs> what did all of this 1950s America mean for the Jews? The Jews were ready for normalcy. God knows they needed it. They were ready to, ex to escape the stigma of a pariah people and of being an outsider. They were ready for a world which moved from what we in sociology call ascribed status to achieved status. That is, where what you are is not a result of birth, but a result of your own achievements. They were ready for a world in a term that we now use, that was governed by the meritocracy, where you could reach any position you wanted to by dint of your efforts, from who I am to what I do. And who I am is being like you. In a statement that was perhaps typical of the times, a rabbi, Morris Kurtzer, who was then president of the Jewish Chaplains Organization, was asked in June of 1952 to answer the question, what is a Jew? For the readers of Look Magazine, I'm sure many of you remember Look Magazine. It was a major uh, voice in America. It was one of the widest circulation weeklies in America. It claimed a circulation of almost 8 million, and those were the people who bought it. There were all those people who were reading it in doctors' waiting rooms or in the library, probably much more than 8 million. Not only was this printed in Look Magazine, it was reprinted in the Reader's Digest in 1952, which was an even greater mass circulation magazine. Kurtzer's article addressed the question such as, do Jews believe that Judaism is the only true religion? On what points do Christians and Jews agree? Is an, is an American Jew's first loyalty to Israel or America? When we hear these questions today, we have to chuckle a little. But these were the important questions that Jews in the 1950s felt they had to answer. His answers, which I assume had to be tacitly endorsed by these mass American publications that printed and reprinted them, stressed that American Jews were not really different from the white middle class, middle class Christians. <laughs> Freud would love it. <laughs> American Jews were really not different from the white middle class Christians around them. They were tolerant, democratic, and unabashedly American. Quote, 
Jews do not presume, presume to judge the honest worshiper of a faith. Moreover, Kurtzer explained, quote, both Jews and Christians share the same rich heritage of the Old Testament. They both believe in the fatherhood of one God, in the sanctity of the Ten Commandments, the wisdom of the prophets, and the brotherhood of man. As for the question of dual loyalties, and this is a theme that came up again and again in publication after publication, sermon after sermon, brotherhood meeting after brotherhood meeting, the only loyalty of an American Jew is to the United States of America without any ifs, ands, or buts, he wrote. The state of Israel is the ancestral home of his forefathers, the birthplace of his faith. As a haven for over a million Jews after the agonies of the past 20 years, it has a special meaning for Jews all over the world. But spiritual bonds and emotional ties are quite different from political loyalty. As Kurtzer put it, Jews were characterized by three principles, love of learning, worship of God, and good deeds. But these, of course, were not the source of either a sense of superiority or separation. On the contrary, the ancient rabbis taught that their laws stipulated that we are required to feed the poor of the Gentiles as well as our Jewish brethren. In other words, Kurtzer told us, told the rest of the world, don't worry, the Jews are loyal Americans, they're like all other Americans, they like Israel, but have no fear. 1954 was not only the year of the Brown versus Board of Education decision, or of McCarthyism. 1954, it turns out, was the year the Jews were celebrating what they called the tercentenary of Jewish settlement in America. Now, of course, most Jews uh, came really after 1881 in the great uh, migrations of Eastern European life. Nonetheless, the tercentenary was a way of celebrating 300 years of Jewish belonging in America. And you can imagine how important in 1954 that was. It was an opportunity once again to emphasize this belongingness in America, which perhaps more than any other theme characterizes those 1950s. Suburbia was really the best place for this. In suburbia, every American Jew, whatever his ideology, was an assimilationist. Since assimilationism in America was a rejection of the immigrant ghetto and all that it symbolized, suburbanites knew that the Jewish ghetto in America was entered into only to be abandoned. This could best be accomplished in the Jewish movement to the suburbs. And what was it like in those suburbs for the Jews? As Albert Gordon, a rabbi in Newton on the suburban frontier outside of Boston, writing at the end of the decade, explained, the new Jewish suburbanites believe that since we are all Americans, it is not good for Jews or any other ethnic or religious group to live together forming their own community. They fear segregation in contrast to their parents, who in many cases sought it. So in a sense, we can say that if once Jews had affirmed the psychological importance and value of their being different to ensure their survival, if European Jewry, perhaps in its golden years, affirmed the differentness of being Jewish, American Jewry, in this first post-war decade, stressed the opposite. They, too, believed that separate was not equal. To be sure, American Jews didn't rush to the suburbs. For American Jewish life, uh, life was still with people. And so, in effect, in the beginning, they tried to find some middle ground. They tried to, to find a kind of stabilized pluralism, or as my uh, colleague uh, Eric Rosenthal, who was writing in the 50s, called it, acculturation without assimilation. So, for example, for American Jews, the ideal at first wasn't the suburb, but rather the luxury apartment building. And when they moved to suburbs, they were really these apartment buildings turned on the side. They were these tract houses or row houses next to each other. 
and they tended to live in neighborhoods that were highly concentrated with other Jews. But the suburb was different, since the nature of the suburb was such that the number of Jews that would live in a suburb, it, the, the concentration could simply not be as high. Moreover, there was contact with non-Jews who were also the neighbors. Already in the 50s, Jews were redefining, as a result of their suburban experience, what it meant to be Jewish. I have a friend who is not Jewish, a typical 1950s Park Forest, which was a suburb in uh, Chicago area. A Park Forest suburbanite is quoted as saying, I have a friend who is not Jewish who told me how fortunate I was in being born Jewish. Otherwise, I might be one of the 16 or 18 out of 20 Gentiles without a social con conscience and liberal tendencies. From the social and cultural standpoint, a man is lucky to be born a Jew. Being Jewish was then having a social conscience or a liberal political attitude. It offered a chance of demonstrating superiority but a superiority that allowed you to be part of America at the same time. So there was, on the one hand, in this parents' generation, this transitional generation, a lingering sense of Jewish superiority in the 1950s. It was surely these reverberations of superiority and the belief, the conviction that there could be a controlled acculturation that made it possible in 1950 for the sociologist Nathan Glazer, writing in the pages of Commentary magazine, to assert categorically that, quote, despite their prosperity, Jews show very little tendency to assimilate. They intermarry less than any other ethnic group. They do acculturate. That is, they drop traditional habits and speech and become culturally indistinguishable from other Americans. Yet the line that divides them from the others remains sharper than that separating any other white group of immigrants. Was he ever wrong? It didn't turn out that way. In fact, during the 1950s, the breaks against assimilation increasingly failed to work. There were at least three deterrents to Jewish assimilation that no longer worked in the 1950s. Number one, Jewish rejection by the dominant Gentile society. In fact, Americans were not rejecting Jews. I won't talk about it so much today as I will next time, about the extraordinary, astonishing decline of anti-Semitism. Two, a sense of bankruptcy of non-Jewish culture. A Jew who lived in a shtetl in Poland and who looked around at the Gentile culture that surrounded him didn't want to be a Polish peasant. That didn't beckon. That didn't attract him. There was nothing better in not being Jewish, so they stayed within the Jewish domain. But in America, there was no sense of the bankruptcy of non-Jewish culture. It was wonderful. It was attractive. It was what they wanted to be. It is what they had come for. And third, feelings of guilt for abandoning the Jewish community were not there. They didn't feel guilty when they abandoned the Jewish community because they were doing it in groups. Their friends were doing it. And they also believed, increasingly, that they could abandon the Jewish community without actually abandoning it, abandoning it. It was a subtle kind of leakage, a kind of dripping out. Part of what they did was build synagogues. A Gallup poll in the 1950s, in 1954 to be exact, showed that 79% of American adults were members of a church. You may recall, some of you, that America of the 50s was when people used to say the family that prays together stays together. And all of this about religion and Eisenhower saying, I don't care what religion you have as long as you have a religion, or something to that effect. The 1950s is when they put under God into the Pledge of Allegiance and in God we trust on the money. It didn't help the value of the money. It didn't really help the allegiance in the country, as we saw in the 60s, but people believed in God, whatever that meant. 
the Jews also built synagogues as their neighbors did. In fact, the, uh, the joking phrase was that during the 1950s, Jews developed a Jewish edifice complex. <laughs> <clears throat> By 1952, there were about $60 million being built on synagogue buildings, and that was a lot of money in the 1950s. But affiliation was not the same as involvement, and certainly not the same as the intensity of involvement. A 1958 poll of weekly attendance in the synagogue showed that only 18% of American Jews went to the synagogue, versus 74% of Catholics and 40% of Protestants. So Jews built those synagogues, but going was another story. And even among the so-called synagogue leaders, the presidents, the head of the boards, the men's club, the ladies' auxiliary, only one out of three admitted to attending services with any frequency. Suburban Jews might still be building synagogues, but they were by no means filling them. The fact is that, as Will Herberg explained in 1950, it had become normal for Jews, even for synagogue members, to believe in and observe nothing in particular. <laughs> Synagogues, in fact, were either a kind of propedeutic, a prologue to assimilation, or a break against it as a cultural enclave. A synagogue was this strange institution. For some, building the synagogue was like building the church. Just as they didn't go to church, they didn't go to the synagogue, but they had one. For others, the synagogue became the cultural enclave, the last Jewish ghetto. It was the place people went to feel Jewish. And they didn't always need to feel Jewish, not very often. What about Jewish education? Jewish education was another part of the story of the 1950s. Essentially, there are three domains of Jewish education. The afternoon or supplementary school, including Sunday schools, the day schools, and Jewish studies at the university level. In the 1950s, the big story was afternoon schools. Day schools in 1950 only had about 20,000 students. 16 times that number were in the afternoon schools. In 1958, 47% of American Jewry had children in afternoon schools, 45% in Sunday schools, in eight, and 8% 8 in day schools. Uh, let me change that. Of the people getting Jewish education, 47% were in afternoon schools, and 45% in Sunday schools and 8% in day schools. One-fifth to one-third of American Jewish children received no Jewish education altogether. And what was the nature of that Jewish education? I imagine many of you are familiar with it. That afternoon school <laughs> was kid stuff. It was where the children were brought by the parents while the parents went elsewhere. In the beginning, it was a five-day-a-week school. The educators, many of them were immigrants who were really great scholars, many of them, who found themselves as immigrants forced to teach Hebrew school to children who had no real idea why they should be there, whose parents believed they should be there because it was some kind of connection to the Jewish world in which they had grown up. In fact, Jewish education is a, is, is, is a strange phenomenon. It's always controlled, there's a cultural lag, it's always controlled by the generation who is educating itself in its own image of the past, but it's always behind what the people who are going through it are experiencing at the time. So the kind of Hebrew schools that the generation of my parents created for me was the place that they would have gone to if they were going to Hebrew schools, but I was the one who was being sent. <laughs> it was an afternoon school where we gave a, gave a very hard time to those teachers. <laughs> we learned that we didn't want to be there. We learned more than we wanted to learn, and very often found that in our homes, what we were learning in school was increasingly irrelevant, except at those times when we were asked to perform, such as the Passover Seder or at Bar Mitzvah time, <laughs> 
and the like. School represented the parents' view of what Jewish education had to be, and the message that was given implicitly to all of us, because our parents weren't getting a Jewish education by and large, was that Jewish education was kid stuff, and that also meant, as we soon learned, that Judaism was kid stuff, because as soon as we got older, we could quit. <laughs> when we got to bar mitzvah age, we stopped. Just as, a, as an aside, imagine making some of the most important life decisions on the basis of something you learned before the age of 13. Choosing, say, who you're going to marry before the age of 13. Choosing your profession before the age of 13. That's what people did with their Judaism. The choices we made about Judaism was on the basis of our experience of what we had gotten in Hebrew school and what we stopped doing after the age of 13. Well, you can guess the nature of the Judaism that emerged from that. You don't have to guess. We've lived through it. You know the kind of Judaism that emerged after that. Still, in spite of this, between 1950 and 1960, enrollment went up by 131%. So even though this Jewish education, which in retrospect, as bad as it was, seems to have been better in some ways than what happened subsequently, at least in supplementary schools, more and more young people were going into this education and coming out of it with something less than they could have received. The faculty was, in a sense, trapped, frustrated, angry, disappointed, and as they died out, were not replaced. Because, in fact, the Jews who wanted to make it in America did not want their children to be Hebrew school teachers. They wanted their children to be successful physicians and lawyers and professionals of all sort. So who was left to give a Jewish education to their children? The people who couldn't make it in the outside world, perhaps. The immigrants who were too old to make it in the outside world. Or, alternatively, people who didn't know much of anything. And it was and remains one of the most difficult tasks for those involved in Jewish education to find competent Jewish educators. This was just beginning in the 1950s. What would happen in the 1960s and 1970s would be exponentially more complicated. What about college Jewish studies? Well, it was very meager, to say the least. There was a man by the name of Joshua Starr, a very distinguished professor, who, if he were alive today, by virtue of all of his credentials, would probably have the most prestigious chair in Jewish studies at any one of the university campuses that he chose. In 1950, Joshua Starr committed suicide because he could not find a job in Jewish studies in this country, because there was very little Jewish studies in this country. In that regard, we see how much has changed since 1950. And what about marriage and fertility, which is certainly an important part of the story. We've talked about residence. We've talked about the change in uh, Jewish education. Marriage and fertility, the number of children we have and who we marry, is a great part of understanding the Jewish experience in America. In part, the story of marriage and fertility of Jews is a function of mobility aspirations. Jews moved out of the ghetto and out of the constraints of Jewish tribal identity. Jews during the 1950s began that extraordinary change in our life organization. We had more schooling than ever before. Jews began to go to the university in extraordinary numbers. In 1952, 62% of American Jews were already attending college. They were 7.5% of the college population, while there were under 3% of, of the American population. There were about three times as many as the Gentiles proportionately going to the university. Well, the more school you have, among other things, 
the later you marry. And if you marry later, you have fewer children. And that's not good for the Jews. In 1957, more, plus or minus 3% of Jewish females between the ages of 14 and 19 were married versus 13% of all other religious groups. A lower birth rate, a later marriage, even the so-called baby boom, about which we have all heard so much over the years. Turns out Jews didn't participate in the baby boom so much. <laughs> Our baby boom was 2.5 children per family. Replacement, as you all know, is about two children per family. Two people have two children. We went from 2.3 to 2.5. And even there, we were on average about three quarters as fertile as the rest of the American population. And since the baby boom, American Jewry has begun an inexorable fertility decline. The life choices that Jews began to make in the 1950s led to that decline. In fact, the most sustained decline that happened without any direct government intervention recorded for any group in recent history. The Jews are like everyone else, only more so when it comes to the decline of fertility. And in fact, if we look at the traditional variables that, associate, that are associated with higher fertility in the United States, we can see that these don't apply to Jews. The things that are associated with higher fertility in the United States are rural residents, not our story, poverty, thank God, not our story, contraceptive ignorance, low education, farm and blue collar occupations, those are the people who have lots of children, plus the ultra-Orthodox. <laughs> we don't qualify. <coughs> Nevertheless, while we were, as Jews, having more education and fewer children, intermarriage was still relatively rare in the 1950s. While, for example, 50% of Lutherans married non-Lutherans in 1950, Nine out of 10 Jews still married other Jews. Even in 1957, and 1957 is an important year for census because, as you know, the American census does not ask about religion. But in 1957, they tried it. There was a great deal of, uh, of ob objection to this afterwards, but 1957 is probably the most exact count we have about Jews in America. In 1957, as far as in marriage was concerned, 88% of the Catholics married other Catholics, 81 to 83% of Protestants married other Protestants, and 94% of Jews married other Jews. To those whose generation came of marrying age in the 1950s, intermarriage was still viewed as suicide. And the assumption was that if a Jew married a Gentile, that Jew was going to be lost forever to the Jewish community. But since there were so few of them, it was a concern, perhaps an anxiety, but really not something to lose sleep over. These were the life decisions that occurred in the 1950s. They very much set the stage for what would come afterwards. While American Jews focused on their accomplishments in educational and professional advancement, on their full-fledged entry into the mainstreams of American life, on making it into the meritocracy and the upper reaches of the middle class, on the decline of anti-Semitism, on the miraculous successes of the fledgling state of Israel, and even on their success in Jewish institution building during this decade, they ignored the falling birth rate, and they remained blind to what the long-term costs of these decisions that they were making would be in the years ahead. By the end of the 1950s then, Judaism, the religion, and Jewishness, ethnic self-consciousness, no longer filled the cognitive and behavioral universe 
that American Jews inhabited. While those who were parents during those years still felt some attachments to Jewish identity, they were ambivalent at best and empty at worst. To their children, these attachments, they went to shul on Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah. They were concerned about all of these Jewish matters. They always looked in any kind of a disaster where their Jews killed. Those kinds of concerns to their children, these attachments were often incomprehensible and not very important. Often, it was an aging grandparent who stayed behind in the city and in the world of tradition, who was the youngster's only genuine connection to Jewish ethnicity and religion. In New York, you could sort of see it. On Sundays, the people drove from Long Island over the bridge to the Bronx to visit Grandma on the Grand Concourse, and then back out to Long Island to Nassau County or wherever it was. It, it happened in all of those cities where Jewish settlement was. The youngster's only genuine attachment to Jewish ethnicity and religion remained in the city with that other generation. But for the most part, Jewish attention and attention in general was focused elsewhere, both by the parents and the children of the 50s. Jewry of the 1950s had few, if any, long-term plans for their Jewish future. They simply assumed it would take care of itself they didn't even have a very good idea of the present. Indeed, they didn't even bother to look very carefully at themselves. The truth was, and this is certainly part of my own disciplinary concern, there were no Jewish sociologists to speak of working in the 1950s, perhaps one or two. But the truth was, as Seymour Martin Lipset asserted in 1954, as part of those tercentenary celebrations the academics were getting on, and looking for some money, as we always are. He said, while it's easy to reel off the names of dozens of important Jewish sociologists, it would be difficult, if not impossible, to list a dozen important sociological studies of Jews. The significance of that was the sociologists were the ones looking, who would look at and help us discover in the 60s and 70s what was happening to Jewish life. This lack of preparation and understanding was tragic. For it meant that American Jewry was not fully prepared for the upheavals and threats to its survival, which would become vividly apparent in the years ahead. By the end of the next decade, they would already feel the anxieties about Jewish life in America, the anxieties that came with the 1960s and the 70s that would color much of the rest of the century for those who cared about the future of Jewish life here and even those who cared would be a shrinking few. The sociologists who would study them were not far behind and would become part of the 1960s and 1970s. But in 1950, Jews were living still in a fool's paradise, which they thought was suburbia. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.